Hi again, everybody. It's Jeremy Bourne at Gray Matter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, a couple more people are still getting in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We got a ton of questions about iFix and iFix 6.0 that we really wanted to have a kind of a follow-up forum from the one that we did about a month ago, which you can find on our YouTube channel or through uh, uh, graymattersystems.com. So we got all these questions during uh, that webinar and afterwards, so we really wanted to open it up to people who had more questions and get our experts back together once again to kind of go through uh, questions in advance and and just get really deep into some of the, some of the issues that you guys are seeing or, 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 or that you wanted expanded on from last time. So this is a really great opportunity to do that. So thanks for joining us again and thanks for getting your questions in. And um, while we're going through today, if you have other questions, follow-ups that you want to submit, uh, please use the GoToWebinar function, the chat function, where you can put in questions. I'll see them, and if it's relevant to a question that we're in the midst of answering, I'll be happy to pose it to our experts. And uh, I can also, we'll also have time at the end. So if we're getting, um, you know, toward the end of the questions and you, and you have one, go ahead and throw it out there on the uh, text chat function and I'll make sure to bring it up. So with that, I'd like to introduce our two panelists today. We have Scott Duhame from GE Digital and we have Dave Geiger from Gray Matter. So uh, Scott, uh, please introduce yourself everyone and then Dave, uh, do the same and then we'll get right into the questions. Yeah, thanks Jeremy, appreciate it. <clears throat> so Scott Duhame here uh, based in uh, a very rainy Foxborough, Massachusetts today, uh, and uh, iFix product manager amongst other products that we produce here at GE Digital. Thank you very much for your loyal support and your feedback. It's what makes our products better. And uh, as Jeremy had suggested, we we released iFix 6.0 in uh, late October of uh, of uh, 2018. So. Uh, uh, we certainly have now had some folks get their hands on it, and we look forward to being able to answer some of the questions that you have. And Dave? Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Geiger. I'm a solution architect with Gray Matter. I spend uh, most of my time doing digital transformations within the iFix space, and um, spent uh, um, some years here developing some graphics and getting used to uh, the iFix workspace and the back end, and looking forward to help you out with some of these questions today. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Scott, do you want to go ahead and uh, just start tackling question one for us? Sure. Uh, so the first question, I can read it. I'm sure everybody can. But the question was, is, does going to the new 6.0 database structure have an issue with older existing tags that use the dash instead of the underscore character for the separation? Um, I actually did go back to the engineering team to validate this. We actually tested it. Uh, we don't see any issues. Um, both of those characters are still still supported uh, in the uh, long tag names. So do you want to go to second question? Okay, uh, so the second question is a little bit more complicated. Um, and in this, the writer is asking us the differences between three SCADA, HMI SCADA products, two of which are GE and uh, one is not. So. Um, we don't, I can't say that we have a lot of time to get into differences between uh, iFix, Simplicity, and SciTac. Um, I do believe we do have a uh, competitive um, a slide deck for the SciTac uh, specifically. Uh, and I'd be interested to understand whoever asked this question, what market you're in and uh, where you're seeing that particular competitor. Uh, always interested to find out <clears throat> where, we, where we see these players. In terms of iFix and Simplicity, um, you know, both are great HMI SCADA options from GE Digital. They have many similarities, um, and we actually continued to co-develop them along the same path for very good reasons, uh, and we can actually shorten our development cycle uh, if we borrow from one and, uh, and put it into the other. Fundamentally, the main technical differences, you know, are the polling engine that, that iFix has versus you know, simplicity um, and is uh, more of an ask. Uh, it you know gets unsolicited data, so it's a, it's it's more of an engine type. I would say iFix and simplicity have a lot of similarities at the SCADA layer. Um, 
Simplicity may be better positioned in energy and power markets. Uh, iFix is very much a, a toolkit that can pretty much do anything you want it to do. Um, and I would say a big commercial difference is the channel. So iFix, the traditional uh, channel partners like Gray Matter, uh, have been with us a very long time, TMMI, and uh, the SI community that may be on this call. <clears throat> very strong channel play for iFix, uh, just how it grew up. And while simplicity tends to be uh, more associated with the GE hardware business um, and sold through that particular application. So I think in terms of graphics, uh, iFix is still a vector-based graphic, GDI, GDI plus tool. That was a, a secondary question in, in that one. So long-winded, but there's the best answer I have. Scott, we got this uh, kind of couple of variations on this next question from a couple of different people. Um, we'll go ahead and flip to it. it. It's just about, you know, different operating systems that are going to be supported in the future. What about that yep. one? So, that, I mean, that's an interesting question to me because it shows that there's a strong interest in the embedded market. Yet, when I look at the, you know, when I look at sales numbers, I mean, embedded is less than 1% of iFix sales. Uh, I'll say a couple things there iFix, it, iFix is iFix is iFix. When you install iFix, you install iFix. It doesn't matter what flavor of um, your, your, you've bought, similar to Historian, you're installing the program iFix. Its use is controlled by the licensing. So the concept of embedded really only exists in the licensing. And, and, uh, and so yes, the embedded key, we have found with the release of 6.0, that the embedded license key actually checks for a very specific registry file that lives only in Windows 7 embedded. And if it's not there, the license won't run and iFix won't run, okay? So what we did is we released, uh, we still support iFix embedded with 6.0, but it, it will have to run on Windows 7 embedded. Um, we do have plans um, in this development cycle, sometime hopefully before the mid part of the year, to actually test and support Windows 10 IoT. So that's our plan uh, to test iFix 6.0 embedded with Windows 10 IoT. We haven't done that yet. I don't have a time frame, but that's our plan. Um, who knows what comes up in that, but that's our plan. Okay, great. Thanks, Scott. Um, this next one, I feel like we devoted a good chunk of our last session to trying to answer. And you know the question is, what is the migration path from iFix 5.8 to iFix 6.0? And come on, to me that's kind of like, well, how do I upgrade? Dave, do you want to take that one on? Absolutely. Um, so iFix 5.8 to iFix 6.0 is not a large backend change, other than the tag nomenclature and the ability to shelf alarms. Um, so the caveat around that is, is always taking backups and snapshots when you're doing your um, upgrades. And then um, all of these upgrades are, are tested thoroughly with regression testing. So um, moving all your files into a new server or just running the install on top of the 5A system um, is not a very complicated task. There's no conversion tools or anything like um, some of the, the very old style of uh, iFix um, with, uh, with the fix and fixed desktop. Um, and then uh, just following the IPI um, documents to make sure that you're all compatible with your versions and your um, Windows OS. And ultimately, remember to you know upgrade your clients before your SCADA nodes. So when you're making this change, kind of do all the pieces before the uh, your your main SCADA, whether it's failover or not. So nothing too complex, nothing like uh, a large uh, fixed conversion. Um, your pictures are compatible, and uh, your database um, is able to be imported into iFix 6.0, no problem. Scott, did you want to add to that? No, I think Dave is spot on. I mean, obviously, we tested in the release of 6.0. Um, we upgraded from 5.9 to, to 6.0. We tested that many, many times, not necessarily 5.8 or 5.8 SP2. But uh, as Dave said, um, you know, the, the upgrade should be fairly straightforward. We always recommend just follow normal operating procedures when doing any kind of upgrade. Um, and uh, with 6.0, because of the long tag names, you do have to upgrade your clients first. 
because the older um, clients will not connect or communicate with the iFix 6.0 uh, SCADA node. Scott, we had a follow-up question from one of our participants today. Are, are program blocks still supported in iFix 6.0? Yeah, there's no no change. So all the blocks that existed before still exist. Um, the only uh, caveat is with the alarm shelving. We didn't enable alarm shelving for all blocks, um, most of the basic blocks. Um, but yes, there was no change to any of that programmatic stuff. Um, you know, obviously we upgraded the the toolkits. Um, so if you've developed developed custom applications. You know, in using any of the toolkits, you want to make sure you get the latest uh, 6.0 toolkits as well, um, you know, due to all the changes with long tag names and EDA, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, no changes like that were, uh, were done. So anything that you have, you would not have lost. Okay, thanks. I think this next one might be a question for Dave, and it relates to uh, configuring two independent standalone SCADAs. Uh, Dave? Yeah, so this question is kind of configured two independent standalone SCADAs without failover option enabled. How do we need to have a remote node configured with standalone SCADA 1 and 2? And essentially, it comes down to your networking configuration within the SKU. So adding the node names of the remote SCADAs will allow you eyes into those SCADAs databases and allow you to interact with those databases from your remote clients. So rather than having a, a single um, SCADA with um, SCADA 1 and 2 being primary secondary, um, if these are two standalone different name SCADAs, we'd have to communicate them on, on two parallel paths um, to your clients. So um, it's, it's a little different of a question. And uh, if, there's, if there's more details around that question from the, uh, the one who asked, um, make sure you get in touch with us and, and maybe understand a little clearer as far as maybe an architecture standpoint. And uh, we can chat through that solution. Cool. Um, so our next one is another migration question, and it's just about going from, from four to six, Dave. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, um, some, some users may be familiar uh, from years and years ago, um, moving from fixed desktop and a, and a fixed 3.5 to 7.0 um, into iFix, there were some migration tools you had to use, which would um, convert a, a pretty high percentage of, of your content on your graphics into your iFix environment. And um, again, we had to make those uh, adjustments to the new interface. Um, back to iFix 4.0, uh, some of the things you might find um, are Visi Connects objects. So you need to make sure you upgrade them to a newer version for some um, extended features or compatibility. And other things to note are um, since then, there's been enhanced coordinates, uh, things like smooth shapes on the graphics, a lot of enhancements to the interface. So you may be looking at the same graphic um, but flexibility as far as different interfaces. So if you host it on web space, or you host it on something like web HMI, um, having enhanced coordinates and enabled, uh, enables zoom to fit where you can have um, different sized uh, resolutions and iFix can handle those resolutions and fit to frame. So it would, it would enable the user to um, you know, have more flexibility upon like using it on your laptop versus on a, a large screen uh, in a control room. So some of these other things are kind of, piece of the screen specific with the migration. Um, but again, as far as exporting your database, doing an FDK backup, um, moving your files around, everything uh, is compatible. Uh, it just comes down to iFix 6.0, again, doing your clients first, um, and then importing it. Uh, all your, update all your clients, and then manage your SCADAs um, at the end, and just be conscious of the uh, backwards compatibility that iFix 6.0 has introduced. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, Scott, the next one is a two-part question, and um, it's kind of uh, the first part is kind of strategic, and the second is is um, you know more technical. Yep. Uh, so, so what business drivers would drive upgrades, um, and are there any IT challenges that you know hinder upgrades from earlier versions to to iFix 6.0? So, uh, business drivers. Yeah, I mean uh, we actually talked about this in the previous webinar um, there's a lot of good reasons that you want to stay current not just because hey it's the latest and greatest but you know obsolescence you know increases risk right so uh, we have the tendency to support the current version um, plus two back so if you're currently on ifix 5.5 you know we did announce uh, 
an end of life for that particular ver not the product itself, but for that version. And really what that means is over time, you know, we will not be doing SIMs on that particular release. And if they've been fixed in uh, a later version, <clears throat> then uh, then your op option is to upgrade. Um, so, you know, reduce risk by using supported software. You know, as as we get smarter about security and secure by design technologies, we build that into our, you know, software design life cycle. So some of the later versions of iFix, you know, have actually been through, um, you know, third party, you know, hackathons um, to expose, you know, areas. And we're forced as a, a product team to address those before we can release. So no, we don't do that with older older versions. So leveraging the latest technologies to minimize threat of cyber attacks. Um, you know, we like to think that uh, we get better and more stable as all each of the releases that we have include all of the SIMs from previous releases. So, uh, you know, decreased downtime with the latest technology. Hopefully that's an outcome that uh, you should be striving for. Um, and we are incorporating new, you know, HMI capabilities such as high performance uh, HMI, which uh, not only is in the web HMI component Dave just talked about, but in the core iFix as well. So if you want to take advantage of new tools and new visualization, obviously we don't push those back to older versions. So another good reason to, to stay current. Um, benefit from all the new capabilities, Dave mentioned alarm shelving, you know, that's a new one. Uh, the long tag names, OPC UA, et cetera, et cetera, go on and on. Um, and then it's obviously a key benefit for, you know, staying uh, current on an acceleration plan, right? You, uh, you get those free upgrades. In terms of IT challenges, I think the IT challenges come primarily on staying on older versions because you may be on a, we just talked about Windows 7 embedded. So Microsoft obsoletes their operating systems and, uh, you know, we don't backfit sometimes many of our older versions. So and we test the, the latest one, so iFix 6.0, tested on Windows Server 2016, Windows 10. Those are the primary operating systems we're testing on. We we validate on the other ones. But, yeah, I, I think there's probably more challenges from staying on older platforms, uh, especially as, you know, Microsoft pushes out, you know, operating system security patches, right? So um, there's a lot of good reasons and a lot of good business drivers to uh, to, to consider an upgrade. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so the next one, um, you mentioned this, and I know we've talked about it a bit, is about uh, alarm shelving. And they're asking, uh, Dave, is uh, with the new alarm shelving ability, is it possible to have a signal written to the controller that an alarm has been shelved? Yeah, so um, the alarm shelving does not have a, a native um, output to you know, trigger a point in a PLC or, or output that status. Um, what shelving did come with was uh, script control. So being able to look at the status of the tag, um, enable, disable, things like this. And what you can do is you could create a second um, alarm tag having something like interlock at the end of it, which you can pass the status to and then trigger the, your, um, you know, interlock condition in your PLC further on. But um, it doesn't have a, a separate field for um, necessarily an output per se to, to trigger out. So um, they did offer tools to interact with the shelving alarms through your scripting. And um, obviously the uh, the fields that shelving has also has its new, um, uh, again, shelving enabled, shelving is, is it is shelved or it isn't, and um, all the statuses of that tag. But uh, you may have to find something uh, to pass the status to, to output that to um, a condition like this. I understand there's there's ways to do your own shelving, um, you know, things like having an alarm, and then if you you disable the alarm through some kind of command or a button, and enable the status on an info alarm, for instance, which which may not show in your alarm summary. So ultimately, hiding the alarm, presenting it in an info um, priority, and having that alarm still shown as a shell, um, just not being in an alarm state, and then um, doing the inverse to return it back to alarm. So um, you may have to keep using a second tag to have something uh, pass through to, to output from your, your database. But no, we don't have um, necessarily an output um, like it's uh, like you're being like it's asked here. 
Dave, quick follow up on that. Um, one participant is asking, uh, what what happens to the shell tags when the SCADA server is restarted? Um, I believe they get reset. Um, that's a good question. I haven't actually tested that thoroughly yet. Um, yep. I know if you go ahead, Scott, if you have some. Nope, you're right. It's uh, and actually, I did ask this question of the engineering team because it's come up before. Uh, those are are currently stored in in memory so if you happen to reboot the server or bring ifix back up the the state returns back to normal so they're not shelved anymore and we are looking at ways to uh to enhance that capability uh to make those um stay permanent but yeah they do go away Great. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, now, the caveat today, to that is, I yeah. mean, <laughs> we're hoping you're not, you know, in a production environment, we're hoping iFix is, you know, you're not bringing it down all the time, right? So uh, we hope that doesn't, that isn't a, an issue, in other words, um, in in most production type environments, because iFix remains up, unless you're going through something like an upgrade process, right? So um Maybe that's some worst-case scenario planning or something. Right. Just an editorial comment by me, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so just a reminder uh, that we're getting close to the end of our uh, submitted questions. So if you do have questions, go ahead and pop them into that questions panel on GoToMeeting. Uh, so the next one, Dave, uh, it, the question is, can, can I run iFix 6.0 on uh, Win 10 as clients, but leave my servers running 5.8 on server 2012R? Yeah, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, it just comes down to um, iFix versions compatibility with the operating system. So as long as you're looking at the uh, important product information sheets, the IPIs, as we mentioned before, and uh, kind of just mention, just make sure that when you're um, installing or looking at the version that you're putting on that um, 5.8, uh, machine that it's that's compatible. So the two versions here are obviously both compatible. So um, there, there's definitely no foreseen problems with that. And I, I actually see this as a two-part question, Dave. Now that I read it again, um, mm -hmm. but the answer is still yes uh, because it's two parts. It's it's a mixed operating system question, clients versus server, and a mixed server versus clients question version for iFix. So as long as the but you, you you couldn't do the reverse. So in other words, you can't run uh, uh, a 5.8 SCADA node, uh, excuse me, and or a 5.8 client and upgrade your server to 6.0. But your as we stated before, your clients can be the latest iFix, and they can still communicate to your older SCADA node. So that was kind of a trick question, but it's a two-parter as I see it now. Uh, Scott, does iFix 6.0 support OPC UA? So right, yes, that was one of the things that we uh, did release with iFix 6.0. Note that it's an OPC UA server. Um, so with our, our release, you can use iFix as a source of data to OPC UA clients. Uh, for example, I don't know why you'd want to do this, but you could use a Simplicity client and an iFix 6.0 node, um, and you can actually, you know, change set points, et cetera, through that simplicity client using OPC UA. Um, what's in development for future release, um, timing TBD, uh, is the OPC UA client capability of iFix, but that's currently in development. So, so yes, it, it supports it from a server standpoint, and that's all three data events and alarms, by the way. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple of more questions. Um, before I get to those, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that we have a series coming up in a couple of different cities, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, and Denver, uh, February 26th in Salt Lake City, Phoenix, February 27th, and Denver, February 28th, kind of back to back to back there. It's called our Empower Up series, and it's, uh, it's a summit for OT specialists. So for those first three, you can go on our website and sign up right now. Uh, we really encourage you to check it out. It's it's designed for engineers, operators, managers, you know, people who are really at home on the plant form, uh, floor and specialize in operational technology. Uh, we have the agendas out for those events and, you know, spots are already going pretty quick. So make sure to look for those on our site at graymattersystems.com. And very soon you'll be able to sign up for events in Orlando, Kansas City, and Toronto. 
those are all going to be in March, March 5th, 7th, and 19th in those, um, but the ones that you can get into right now, so if you're sitting in one of those cities as we speak or near it or going to be in Salt Lake City or Phoenix or Denver, uh, please do go ahead and, and sign up for that. All right, so we'll go back to the questions, um, and it looked like we had a, a follow-up on shelved alarms, which has gotten a lot of discussion today. So uh, are shelved alarms persistent after importing points, uh, which stops the SAC? Not sure who would be best on that one. Yeah, I think the, the answer is still the same um, okay. as they were before. Um, that specific question, <clears throat> I know we we validated stopping and starting IFIX. Um, um, uh, the question would be if you're just updating the database and adding tags to the database. That actually is a good question. I, I don't know. It, I would get the sense that just modifying the database in runtime is not going to affect your existing um uh alarms that you've shelved but i i'd have to get an answer on that one okay yeah we can follow up and and get deeper into that one um another question that we got today was uh was there work any work done on the scheduler in 60 uh no there wasn't any changes to the schedule i know that uh, we have a, a fan base out there that's been asking for some changes it's in our uh line of sight, uh, some backlog, but nothing specific at this time, but no changes with 6.0. Okay. Uh, we have our last pre-submitted question up on the screen right now. Um, will GE have tools in place to upgrade older iFix applications like, you know, version 5X to, to 6.0? So we're not planning anything at this time. I just would always suggest um, that we try to define, you know, what to look out for in our documentation. Uh, Dave has mentioned it a couple of times, but we have, uh, if you go, you actually you can get these documents, you know, online as a PDF, download them if you don't want them. Obviously, once you install a product, they're available. Um, but the IPI and it's, it's version specific, and we try to spell out all of the things you need to think about from an upgrade perspective, but in terms of tools, no, we're not thinking of any at this time. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, we got uh, one other question, and um, I, th I think I'm reading this right, and the question is, so if if there's two servers, and you know one is networked with, with 6.0 and the other is at 5.9, can they still be a client to each other? Hmm. I'm trying to imagine that scenario. So we've we know we've already stated that the clients need to be updated before the node. You know, so if you're using a five nine node to be a client to six oh, then the answer would be no, you can't do that. They have to be um, they have to be of the same release or or what have you. So I think the client rule applies. Make sure your clients are updated before your server. I mean, there are cha fundamental changes. Long tag names was a fundamental change, not only to the database, but to the EDA. Um, and so it's not, that's the one non-backwards compatible thing. Okay, yeah. I mean, it just means you got every, everything has to be updated to 6L, right? Well, as we said, um, update the clients first, right? In that in that picture that your questioner asked, um, can they be clients to each other? You know, the 6.0 could be a client to the 5.9, but not vice versa. Um, and your, you know, clients, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it actually identifies terminal server clients are, are a great solution because you don't have to go out and update a lot of thick clients, but we certainly know that there's a lot of customers that have a lot of thick clients. Just We're just trying to make them aware before you update that node because you'll lose connection between older clients and 6.0. Make sure the clients are updated first. Okay. Thanks, Scott. So we'll go with, um, I think, one or two more questions here. Uh, if, if you know, when is the first SIM scheduled to be released? 
Um, it may already be released. Um, that uh, SIMs are basically created um, when we have cases that are opened by customers or whomever uh, that find issues that are actually a bug in the product. Um, and uh, we prioritize those based on importance, obviously. And uh, I actually don't know, but <clears throat> we could certainly go look at the, the customer portal, the support portal, and find out if there are 60 SIMs. So I, uh, it could be there's one up there already. Uh, that's not driven by product management. It's driven by actually support cases. OK, great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. A lot of great questions before and during our session. And uh, please know I'll be following up uh, with uh, some more information, including this presentation. And I'll include some links, too, to our Empower Up series, um, which you really owe it to yourself to check it out and to sign up to attend. Um, those are coming up quick. About a month from now is when uh, the first ones are going to be starting, the very first one in Salt Lake, and then Phoenix and Denver on uh, February 26th, 27th, 28th. So I'll include those links along with, um, along with our presentation and some contact information if you want to get into a deeper discussion about iFix 6.0. And I really want to thank uh, Scott Duhame of GE Digital and Dave Geiger of Gray Matter. Thank you both guys for your time and your expertise and for going through um, all of these different questions uh, with folks today. Really appreciate it. Yep. Our pleasure. Great. Thanks yeah, again, thank everybody. Take care.